Hello to the Duchenne community from my home in Massachusetts. I'm Annie Ganote. I'm one of the founders of Solid Biosciences and head of patient advocacy. Joining me today will be my colleague, Dr. Carl Morris, our chief scientific officer. I would like to thank PPMD for always putting the needs and safety of the patient community first, for quickly transforming a massive conference and turning it into a virtual setting, I'm sure was no small task. I'm hopeful that this virtual setting allows even more families the ability to participate this year. I'm especially thinking of the newly diagnosed families. As the mother of a now 10-year-old son with Duchenne, I know vividly how overwhelming and challenging those first days, weeks, and months are after diagnosis. Please know you have the most supportive community around you to lift you up, and we will be together again. As a public company, I need to provide our forward-looking statements. For those of you I have not had the pleasure to meet or are unfamiliar with solid biosciences, I'd love to take a few minutes to tell our story. My husband, Ilan, and I received our son, Eitani's diagnosis in October of 2012, a day that changed our lives forever, like I'm sure all of you. We left our careers. We moved from London to Boston to start a company. And together with some extraordinary individuals and other members of the Duchenne community, SOLID was launched in 2014. But SOLID is not just about Eitani. He, of course, was our spark. But very quickly, we knew that we would be dedicated to every person living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We have employed and partnered with the best and brightest experts in Duchenne and gene therapy. We set lofty goals from the beginning to develop transformative treatments that will improve the lives of all patients living with Duchenne, regardless of age, mutation, race, geography, or disease progression. And to tackle our goals, we live by core principles. Patients are the center of everything that we do. They are woven through the fabric of every department and everything that we do at our company. We operate with honesty, integrity, and transparency. And I hope that you see and feel that by everything that we produce from our community letters to our outreach, to our day-to-day -day interactions. We feel and live and breathe for this patient community. Scientific rigor. We knew that to develop a drug, we have to follow every single step. We are aggressive, but we must follow the common wisdom of drug development. As a Duchenne mom, I know that time is not on our side. What I can promise is that we will never give up on our mission. We will do everything possible to bring safe and effective treatments to this community. And with that, I will hand it over to Carl Morris to provide an update on our gene therapy clinical program, Ignite DMD. Thanks, Annie. Hi, everyone. My name is Carl Morris, and I'm Chief Scientific Officer here at Solid Biosciences. It's my privilege today to talk to you about our ongoing clinical program, SGT001, is the name for our microdystrophin gene therapy program. Uh, just a little bit of background, uh, as most of you are aware now, um, AV gene therapy uh, needs three components. The first one is the capsid, so the AAV itself. It's the delivery vehicle. What we use is AV9, and it was specifically chosen because of the prior uh, clinical experience and the known muscle tropism of this serotype. Uh, we we picked that uh, to, to use as our delivery vehicle going forward. The second uh, component is the promoter. So we call it CK8. This was actually developed by, by Jeff Chamberlain and Steve Hausko. So what it is, it's the, the, the pieces of DNA that drive expression to, to produce the protein ultimately, um, which is uh, our transgene, the microdystrophin. Uh, it's a regulatory cassette and, and produces a high level of, of, of uh, protein expression in both uh, skeletal and cardiac muscle. The transgene for our microdystrophin is a, is a smaller version of the full-length dystrophin. It was rationally designed and developed by Jeff Chamberlain after years of sort of iterative research and experimentation to really optimize the expression and functionality of the protein. And I'll talk a little bit more about it um, on the next slide. Additionally, an important aspect and a unique aspect to, to our construct is the inclusion of the MLS binding domain that was identified originally by Dong Sheng Zhuang. Now I'll, I'll discuss the, the construct a little bit more. So as, as you can see up the top here, the full-length dystrophin protein is, is a massive protein. Uh, it has 
uh, um, enough, the DNA sequence to produce this protein is three times the packaging size of the AAV, so it's too big to fit in the truck. So what, we, uh, what was done was identify the specific uh, um, protein domains that could be taken out uh, without sort of losing the functionality of the protein itself. This was a uh, work done, again, by Jeff Chamberlain over years and years of, sort of iterative uh, research. Um, he picked and choose, uh, selected uh, the, the various aspects of, of the, the protein that, that were required for function and those that, that were, were somewhat redundant uh, um, in, in uh, the, the protein itself. Um, this took a lot of work and took a, a, a lot of time. But what we have now is, is a very, a sort of the second generation, the next generation um, of microdestrophin protein that, that has some, some unique fun features. The work of Dongsheng Duan was then incorporated into to, to the base of, of the microdystrophin. And so now we include the R16 and R17 repeats that, that allow for NNOS to bind uh, directly to the protein and therefore be localized. And I'll, I'll discuss the, the, the need for NNOS a little bit later. So we, we developed this, and, and, and once everything was selected and put together, we then went ahead and, and, and uh, did the preclinical work to show that the level of microdystrophin expression and the function of the microdystrophin itself uh, was, was uh, good. We did that in, in dystrophic mice and dystrophic dogs. So what I'm showing here is really uh, uh, the, the cross sections of the muscle, both skeletal muscle down the bottom and the heart up the top, uh, showing that, that we're getting good expression of our microdystrophin, the SGT001, at, at two different doses versus that of in the, the, the dystrophic mouse. So why why do we care about it? Uh, NNOS? I think it, it, it's a, a domain that that um, and, and NNOS actually has a function. Uh, where if you look at the top left corner here, in the presence of dystrophin, so looking at the uh, uh, the dystrophin functions by by stabilizing um, the the membrane, this membrane complex, um, and connecting it to the contracting sarcomere. Importantly, what it does is it also localizes NNOS, which is neuronal nitric oxide synthase, uh, uh, to the the membrane. And what that allows is production for those NOs and nitric oxide. So nitric oxide then leaks out of the muscle, goes to the blood vessels, and, and increases the size of the tube. So it allows for more blood to flow towards the muscle and, and, and allows for oxygen to, to then uh, uh, move into the muscle and, and help uh, the, the activity of the muscle. Without dystrophin, and it's shown down the bottom, you see that there's less NO production uh, given the, the lack of the, the localization of NNOS to the membrane. So what that does, it, it doesn't allow for, for the blood vessels to increase in size when there's a demand uh, put on it. And so the like escargot is a, a fancy word for snails. Functional ischemia is, is a fancy way of saying that there's, there's just not enough blood flow to, to uh, uh, give, provide a sufficient oxygen to, to the muscle. So what do we know about and how is this going to work? So what we can do is we can look at Becker's muscular dystrophy. And, and, and highlight, uh, so what we're highlighting here on the right-hand side is that in Becker's uh, uh, muscular dystrophy uh, uh, subject, there are uh, those that have a full endless binding domain uh, in their, their dystrophin uh, uh, protein, while others that have different mutations and therefore do not have the, the endos. So what you can see here is uh, those that actually contain the endos have an increased level of the NOx. So they have a higher level of NOx or nitric oxide than those that do not have the NOx binding domain. And also importantly, uh, there seems to be an, an improvement in function as shown by the 10 meter velocity, walk run uh, uh, step, uh, velocity. So an, in, uh, an increased value there over those that in, with the NOx domain versus those that don't have the NOx binding domain. So that it's good to the proof of uh, concept data coming from, from a, a um, natural history cohort uh, that, that suggests that NOx uh, function may be important. So now I'll talk, uh, uh, move on and, and, and shift gears to, to the, the uh, ongoing clinical trial uh, that, that I think everyone would be interested in. So we, we started um, IGNITE as it was actually designed as a phase one, two dose escalation study into Shen uh, 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 patients age, uh, ambulant age four to 11 or non-ambulant age 12 to 17. Our initial dose was 5E13 vector genomes per kilogram, VGs per kg. And we dosed three patients uh, uh, at, at that level. 
We then evaluated the data, and, and as we planned, we dose escalated up to the 2E14 level for patients 4, 5, and 6. So currently, we, uh, uh, currently we have dosed uh, uh, six patients, and we are uh, um, right now on clinical hold and working directly with the FDA uh, to, to uh, uh, um, get off hold and, and resume dosing. Um, we will work with the, uh, the, the Drug Safety Monitoring Board, so DSMB, and also with the, the institutions uh, that, that will make sure that, that the, the protocol is, is uh, appropriate uh, to, to advance. With this study, uh, there, we, we have a primary endpoint uh, of, of safety and, and uh, tolerability, as well as uh, we lo we're looking at microdystrophin expression at 12 months as, as a primary endpoint. And because we want to learn as much as we can about how the drug uh, could, could potentially uh, provide potential benefit, we are looking at, at multiple uh, uh, functional and, and strength measurements, such as the North Star ambulatory assessment, the pull, uh, 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 the, pull the performance of upper limb, as well as the six month walk test. Uh, we're also evaluating cardiac and respiratory function, as well as MRI uh, going forward to, to really understand what, what our drug can do. So now I'm, I'm excited to share uh, some of our, our more recent data, uh, looking at the biopsies, the three-month biopsies from, from the, the uh, cohort, uh, the 2E14 uh, cohort. So first, uh, what I'm highlighting here is, is a, a low magnification image showing uh, so widespread uh, microdystrophin positive fibers throughout the, the, the muscle biopsy section that we obtained. This is important to really highlight that it, it isn't so sort of small little areas. What we're seeing is, is, is a broad uh, distribution of the AV and SGT001 throughout the, the muscle itself. Each of those little red circles it indicates a, a positive fiber, and you can see that it's spread uh, throughout the muscle. When you start looking in at the, the high resolution or high magnification, you can really see that there is a, a good localization of the membrane, um, and the majority of the fibers in, in here are, are, are positive for microdystrophin. So when we look at, at all of the data from both the 5E13 and the 2E14 cohort, as shown down the bottom right, you can see that we get an increase uh, at, in, uh, at, in the 2E14 from baseline to day 90, and so now we're averaging about 55% uh, of the, the muscle fibers being positive for microdystrophin. So one of the other things that, that I, I, I talked to a little bit is the function of dystrophin is to, to stabilize what's known as a dystrophin-associated protein complex at the membrane, the muscle membrane. And, and I'm highlighting that on the right-hand side, and you can see I'm pointing to what look like pink M&Ms uh, and, and a brown uh, almond M&M &M to, to uh, sort of show that there's localization of the soccer glycan uh, molecules and also NMOS um, that, that is uh, from uh, localization or the uh, uh, production of, of uh, dystrophin or microdystrophin in our case. And so in the middle here, I'm showing the baseline biopsy data uh, that highlights that we don't have any microdystrophin expression as expected on the baseline, but there's a, a, a little bit of a, a beta soccer glycan expression um, at the at, at baseline, but after 90 days, uh, when after 90 days after administration of SGT001, you can see that again we have a, a good expression of microdystrophin. But importantly, there's, there's co-localization of the beta glycan, which is uh, one of those membrane-associated proteins, uh, and there's good uh, co-localization of that with the microdystrophin, and that can be seen sort of the sideways um, snowman up in the top left corner. Again, looking at NMOS this time, a, a, another um, protein that, that's uh, localized by um, and stabilized by, by microdystrophin, you see at baseline, there's really not uh, any signaling observed, uh, either in the NMOS uh, um, uh, from protein ex expression perspective or there's no uh, NMOS activity. But when we look at the day 90 uh, um, uh, biopsies again, Highlighting in the serial section, you can see that, that there is NMOS co-localization with the microdystrophin. And most importantly, the NMOS that is localized appears to be active. And we can see that by looking at the dark blue staining around the muscle fibers in the bottom right-hand corner. There. Moving on to, to Western blood. So what we want to do is uh, uh, evaluate and quantify how much uh, microdystrophin is being expressed. And so uh, using our method, uh, which is uh, we've qualified this method, uh, internally, uh, 
we can show that that here in the representative uh, blot on the right hand side that we, we have the we look at a full length uh, dystrophin as, as our standard curve and then we, we use QC samples throughout um, to, to make sure that we uh, um, we have a good uh, robust uh, assay. So when we do this for our patients in the 2e14 cohort we, we had five percent, eight percent, and seventeen and a half percent of dystrophin expressed. It's important to note that uh, the different methods mean that, that uh, we use different pools of, of, uh, of uh, normal and, and dystrophic muscle tissue, as well as different antibodies. And so it is important to, to note that, that these are, are, are good data for us, and they're internally consistent with, with our um, immunofluorescence. So now that we have uh, the, the data coming out of the 90-day biopsies, I think it's important to really uh, uh, think about how are we going to actually um, uh, produce a sufficient drug uh, uh, for uh, for Duchenne. Duchenne really presents a significant challenge to manufacturing given the, the high number of patients, the need for these high systemic doses, in our case 2E14, and the average weight of the patients that require treatment. So what we've done from the beginning is really to, to uh, think about what is, is uh, the right way, and it has to be scalable and, and to produce a, a significant amount of uh, material as, as we move forward. Um, we selected the HSV approach, um, and we think because it's a scalable and suspension-based method, and, and will really uh, uh, sort of go a long way to help address the anticipated need. Over the past few years, we've really been uh, uh, focused on building consistency in our process, as well as scaling up to, to levels uh, uh, able to support uh, the, the needs of the chain. So currently, um, we've produced multiple batches of 250 uh, liters with our CMO partners um, that allows for, for uh, uh, us to dose multiple, uh, a, a number of patients. Importantly, the 250 liters uh, batches have the ability to dose multiple patients. Um, and there's also, given the, the, uh, um, the, the uh, widely available uh, bioreactors and, and methods that we're using, there, there uh, really sort of is the ability to scale out as well. We, are, we continue to focus and, and, and further optimize our, our process um, and, uh, uh, and scale up. Um, and as you can see here, you know, there, there is the, the ability to potentially move forward into 500 or even 2,000 liter scales. So I, I, to, to finish out, where, where are we? I think um, you know, we are in clinical hold. And, and so our clear and our immediate goal is really to work with the FDA, our, our DSMB, the Drug Safety Monitoring Board, and the clinical site IRBs as quickly as possible uh, to, to resume dosing safely and, and responsibly. We're looking at all aspects of, of our program to really identify areas to either improve and optimize our drug um, uh, and, and or our study to safety, safely and effectively administer SGT001. So to wrap up, we really are excited uh, and optimistic about the promise of SGT001 to provide meaningful benefit in the lives of DMD patients across the disease spectrum and our ability to supply SGT001 to meet those needs. With the, with the biopsy results uh, in, in indicating uh, widespread microstrophin expression and, uh, importantly, and NOS uh, localization and activity in the muscles, we want to get back into the clinic safely uh, and, and move forward with SGT001. We continue to follow, follow the current uh, study subjects per protocol and are really looking to evaluate samples and the functional endpoints from, from the 12-month time point um, at the appropriate time. Uh, we, we hope to be sharing these updates uh, with, with the, the community as soon as possible. And with that, I'll hand it back to Annie uh, for, for a conclusion. Thank you. Thank you all for your time and interest in SOLID. Again, a special thank you to Pat, Ryan, and the rest of the team at PPND. If you have any questions or would like to be in touch, you can reach us at community at solidbio.com. And please keep an eye out for future news and updates through our community letters. These letters are shared by PPMD and other advocacy organizations around the globe. Thanks again, stay safe, and have a wonderful summer. Thank you. <laughs>